There are three trillion trees growing on our planet. But thousands of years ago, before human civilization took hold, the Earth had about six trillion trees. The bad news, every year we're losing 10 billion trees. The good news, we have space on the planet for another trillion trees. These additional trees can absorb a quarter of the human-made CO2 and by that, offer us humans precious time to reduce our emissions and stop climate crisis. Plan for the Planet is taking the lead to achieve this goal with the Trillion Tree Campaign. We children and youth of Plan for the Planet are inviting everyone to join our Trillion Tree Campaign and to plant as many trees as possible as each tree is helping reduce the effects of global warming. But we're not only calling others for action, we are planting trees ourselves. My name is Paulina and I invite you to learn more about our afforestation activities here in my homeland, the Yucatan Peninsula in Mexico. We planted our first tree in March 8, 2015. And soon after, we reached one million trees. That is when we made the pledge that we will nurture every tree planted so far. It only takes 10,000 projects like ours to reach the trillion trees. That's why we want to share our knowledge, experiences and mistakes with everyone in the planet to convince as many other groups as possible to start similar reforestation projects. So here we are today at the Plant for the Planet Tree Nursery and we're gonna discover how seeds become plants. So come check it out with me. From seed to tree, with the support of scientific experts in the field, we implement complex but effective processes that ensures we produce and plant the best quality plants. We plant our seedlings in two different kinds of areas. In flatlands, where the trees have been chopped down and only grass has left behind, and also in degraded forests. These are forests that have been plundered by all big, tall and valuable trees and then have been left behind. We are planting around 5,000 trees every day and increasing this amount as the years go by. On empty lands, we first clear by hand the areas, and then we plant a tree every four meters. If we're planting inside the degraded forest, to preserve biodiversity, we respect the existing trees and plant our seedlings in between them. It's not only about planting them, but making sure they grow. That's why we take care of our plants by planting them during rain season and giving them their right maintenance. So now it's your turn to take action. We need your help to save our future. Good evening, everyone, or afternoon, depending on where you're joining. I absolutely love the video um, that Ms. Princess shared today, really that ending with uh, take action. And over the course of the last few weeks, we've had this back to school webinar season, and we really have wanted to encourage teachers to help to build students that actually take action and become true global citizens through the work that you do with them, through teaching, learning, and through assessment. So thank you for joining us. This is our last event for the back to school season for this month for the prepare, motivate and inspire, equipping students to tackle real world challenges for this webinar season for back to school. We thank you for joining. Just want to remind you that um, those of you who may be joining us for the first time, just a little housekeeping, just to remember that we are in the um, webinar Zoom series. So just remember that upon entering, all members have been placed on mute um, and you can interact with us though using the chat features, also using the Q&A. We want you to be able to leverage the wealth of materials that we'll be sharing with you. I think last week a few um, participants asked, can they get some of the examples that we have for project-based learning? How can we support students with their learning? So we'll be sharing that information with you as well. 
at the end of the sessions today. But I just want to take an opportunity to introduce our host for today. We have two special guests. Ms. Princess Lacewell is joining us back again as our host. She's been just brilliant with the sessions that she has presented over the last three weeks. Um, and Princess is our engagement consultant with National Geographic Learning. She holds a master's degree in instruction and focuses on second uh, dairy literacy. She also has a vast experience in service learning and incorporating 21st century skills into teaching and learning, having served as an international baccalaureate coordinator for many years. Princess is an academic engagement consultant for National Geographic Learning and provides professional development for curriculum, teaching, and learning across the GCC region and Europe. And I would also like to take an opportunity to introduce a very special guest with us. We are joined by our very own National Geographic Explorer, Nora Shawi, and she's a National Geographic Explorer and Egyptian archaeologist. She has been excavating ancient sites in the now Delta, Delta for almost a decade. She has served as a field archaeologist on foreign missions at sites in Egypt and in Northern Sudan. She received her undergraduate degree in archaeology at the University of London School of Oriental and African Studies, followed by a master's degree in archaeology at England's Durham University. Her research is focused on Latin period settlements using material culture and religious ideologies to better understand the impact of royal policy on non-elite Egyptians. Her work as in two, she, um, excuse me, Shawi is also the 2015 National Geographic Young Explorer grant, grantee and is part of the 2017 Young Explorer Leadership and Development Program. Please join me in welcoming our two speakers, Nora and Princess, to today's session. Hi, Nora and hi, Princess. So glad you both were able to join us. I'm excited about today's session because it really brings everything together that we've been talking about over the last few weeks and helping students to become change agents. So welcome both of you. Hi, Davida. Thank you so much for that uh, warm welcome. Super excited to be back today, um, seeing a lot of familiar names popping up uh, in the participant screen. Um, so thank you all for coming back with me week after week and welcome to everyone who's joining us for the first time. I really appreciate you taking the time out of your day to be with us this evening. And I am super, super excited to have Nora with us today. Hi, Nora, how are you doing? Hi, how are you? Thanks for having me, especially in sessions that are in this region. They're super exciting for me. Um, everything's linked with the work that I do. So it's really cool to be able to network with people in this region. And I'm super excited that we're going to be talking uh, a lot about empowering, you know, change agents um, in the classroom. Yes, absolutely. Um, so as Ms. Nora just said, we are talking about empowering change agents for a better tomorrow. And we have three objectives for our time together today to develop a deeper understanding of what it means to be a change agent, and then to explore the benefits of taking action at the personal, local, and global level. And then finally, to be able to implement one or more instructional strategies that support cultivating a classroom environment that encourages students to take action. So as we kind of launch into this, I wanna ask a question. We hear this all the time, we want our students to be change agents. What does this mean to you? Okay, you have a mentee here. Um, if you have uh, another device, you can scan the QR code. Uh, our colleague, Ms. Davida, will drop the link in the chat or you can go to menti.com and type uh, the code in that you see on the screen. What does this mean to you? We want our students to be change agents. What does this mean to you? Okay. See so response is starting to come in.
very nice. Active citizens, global citizens, ability to make a difference. I love that. Be the change in the world. Students being responsible, ability to make a difference. Yes, I love these responses. Take actions towards the world and be responsible. Mm -hmm. Give students the skills they need to be innovative and think out of the box. Risk takers, absolutely. Be able to take decisions and make changes. Oh, I'm, I'm absolutely loving these responses. Please keep them coming. I will share the responses uh, in the pilot that we will be sharing uh, a little bit later. Very nice. So when I was thinking about this and what it means to be a change agent, um, a few things kind of came to mind for me. We want our students to be change agents. What exactly does that mean? A change agent is an individual who actively promotes uh, and facilitates change within an organization, a system, or a society. They play a key role in identifying, planning, and implementing systems or behaviors. They often possess, I think a couple of people said that, leadership skills and the ability to communicate effectively. They also have a deep understanding of the change they are advocating for. And their ultimate goal is to drive positive transformation and help others adapt to new ideas or practices. And I just feel like when you think about this, we want our students to be change agent. They're change agents, excuse me. There's an urgency behind that statement. So let's kind of talk through why it's so important for us to ensure that our students do become change agents. Positive impact. Change agents have the potential to bring about positive changes in their communities, in their schools, and society as a whole, right? They can address pressing issues, improve living conditions, and overall just make the world a better place. I think that came up a few times as well. Empowerment. Encouraging students to be change agents empowers them to believe in their ability to effect change. Their sense of agency uh, can be boosted it, and it really boosts their, their self-esteem and their motivation. Civic engagement, it fosters a sense of civic responsibility. That word responsibility came up over and over on the mentee teaching students that they have a role to play in shaping the future of their communities and their countries. Critical thinking, we talked about this in our very first session. Being a change agent requires critical thinking and problem solving skills. And these are valuable life skills that extend far beyond the classroom. Leadership development. It nurtures leadership qualities such as uh, initiative, communication, and the ability to inspire and mobilize others. Global citizenship, okay? Something that's kind of been at the heart of this entire series. Students who are change agents often develop a broader perspective and a sense of global citizenship, recognizing their interconnectedness within the world. And then innovation. Change agents often introduce innovative ideas and solutions to existing problems, driving progress and advancement in various fields. And then something else that we always say we want from our students, future leaders. Many change agents go on to become influential leaders in their chosen fields, making a lasting impact on society. We have with us today, someone who was a leader in their field. Um, so let's, let's hear from Nora a little bit. A little bit. Hi, thanks, Princess. Um, I wanted uh, to give everyone kind of a little brief about what I do, not bore you too much. Um, so digging through Egyptian history. Basically, I am an Egyptian archeologist and a National Geographic explorer. I dig uh, in Egypt and Sudan mainly. Um, and in Egypt, I'll show you a um, certain uh, specific area where I where I excavate. I'll show you here on the map. Um, 
this is Egypt, as most of you know. Uh, the number one question I get from people is, haven't you already found everything in Egypt already? All the antiquities, I mean, we see it pop up in the news all the time that there are discoveries. Yes, it's true. There are con constantly, um, you know, excavations and discoveries being made. But a fun fact is actually less than 5% of ancient Egypt has been discovered and excavated. And that is mainly because you can see the land mass is massive. And also because the modern Egyptians are living on top of ancient Egypt. So people tend to forget that when we're thinking about Egypt, we think about, you know, the gold and the mummies and the pharaohs and all of that and not think about modern Egyptians actually living there. And our population boom is quite extreme. So we um, have, I think, about 120 or 130 million people. Um, on our Egyptian soil right now. So it's very difficult to control where everyone's living versus where we're digging. Um, so if you can look up north, that green fan-shaped area, um, this is called the Delta. So this is actually, I dig all over Egypt, but that is my main area of focus, my expertise um, that's in my research. So here are um, a couple of the sites that we're still discovering now. Um, are, they're all ancient sites in the Delta region. So it's all very green because this is an agricultural area, very rural. So you find a lot of farming um, and you know a huge uh, chunk of our population lives up here. It's very dense and populated and not very easy to dig because it's not dry and arid like the rest of the Egyptian desert and what you kind of see in all the documentaries. It's um, not as glamorous to be digging up north because it's uh, very moist and wet. There are other ancient Delta branches, uh, Nile branches up in this area. So we dig and look for sites uh, along the ancient Nile branches that have long since dried up. So you can see there's tons of little dots all over this map. These are just the sites that we're finding and people are living on top of this entire area, all of the greenery. People are living there, growing food to actually eat today. So for us, it's very difficult um, to work here. So we're only stuck with, you know, the areas that are not occupied. And um, so we have to work side by side with the people, which I'll delve into deeper later on. That has to do with community archaeology. Um, so digging 101. Why do we do what we do? So basically, besides uncovering the ancient history um, of this country, it's also we're trying to understand where we come from and who we are as humans. So it's not just, I always say, it's not um, just boxed in as Egyptologists or Egyptian archaeologists. We're only focused on Egypt. No, it's actually collectively um, for humanity altogether. We're all connecting the puzzle pieces together as archaeologists all over the world to understand where we as humans come from. So for me as an Egyptian, I'm lucky that I'm from a country so rich in its history, but I also am trying to work on changing the way we view our own heritage. Um, in Egypt, it's oddly enough, not one of the main things that we learn in school about our own history. So it's something I grew up always wanting to know more, but I didn't have enough uh, of the resources available in schools. So this is something I try to work on as an archaeologist as well while I'm in the field to kind of help Egypt, other Egyptians also be aware of where they come from. Another um, thing, that an obstacle that we have while we're excavating here is a race against time, which is always encroachment or funding. There's always a lack of funding to, for our scientific research, with which as educators, I'm sure you're also familiar with. Uh, there's always a lack of funding in um, uh, the research that we're trying to work, do. And encroachment. This is modern encroachment by uh, the modern villages. Um, every year, we keep finding more and more encroachment on the sites we're working on. Technically, that is not allowed. Once it's an archaeological site, no one is supposed to touch that site because um, it's historically rich. But because of the population boom and you know lack of government control, there's always continuous encroachment. So you never know if you're going to come back the next season to your site and find it the way it is. So we're always in a race against time to be able to uncover and learn as much as we can um, while doing it, you know, very meticulously and taking our time to be able to document everything properly. So our main thing is to document, preserve and protect. We're not just digging deep holes and pulling out everything because we're not or that we would be exactly like the looters. We wouldn't be any better. 
So it's much slower for us. We do actually uh, excavate with our tiny little brushes like you see in the movies and our little toolkits, but we do that in uh, to be able to preserve everything and document it properly um, because you have to excavate everything the way you find it. You cannot just rip things out of context because we, we lose all of its, um, the everything we can learn from it the second we do that. So once you see, uh, we do everything from, you know, excavating it from the ground to putting it in a museum where you end up seeing it, uh, hopefully, in the future. Um, so a little bit about a uh, passion starter. Um, I wanted to get into how to um, ignite um, the passion in, in our students. So here are um, a couple sites you can see. Um, this is how the Delta sites, they, they look like. On, on the surface, they're not glamorous. They don't look like things you see in Indiana Jones and things like that, but these are um, rural villages. You can see even in your own countries, this is how it looks like. But right beneath the surface here in this image, you can see uh, this is a foundation for a temple. So this is a, a Greco-Roman temple. Me and my team um, have been excavating for the last six years. And you find these limestone foundations just beneath the surface. So I always try to tell people we don't dig seven, eight meters below the surface necessarily. Some things are literally right beneath your feet. And um, this is just what happens uh, with the natural climate of the, the area. Um, but how do you get into a field like this? This is one of the main questions I always get. How did I even get into this? Um, it's not you know your generic career, I'm aware of that. But basically I wanted to give you a few tips on how to ignite that spark. For me, I personally got into archaeology because of um, a class I took in third grade when I was nine years old. Uh, as I was saying, again, in Egypt, it's very strange. We don't learn a lot about Egyptian history in school, but there was one semester, so only a few months, where we were learning about Egyptian culture. And I remember really vividly, we were being shown um, a reenactment of Howard Carter discovering King Tut's tomb, you know, probably the most famous discovery to date. And I remember seeing that scene and when he was peering through a tiny hole into his tomb and someone had asked Howard Carter, the archeologist at the time, what, are you, what can you see? And he said, wonderful things. And I remember that second of me seeing that video, I just, it changed my entire world. And I thought, I wanna have that feeling and I wanna be able to discover these things and learn more about our history. And ever since then, I you know worked closely with my teacher in third grade actually that I, reconnected with her 15 years later to thank her for actually, you know, I gave her a lot of credit for starting my career that she didn't want to take, but it's true. Um, you know, that uh, put in like planted the seed um, in my head. And ever since then, you know, I just read about it and studied and essentially became a, a, an archaeologist in the end. So it's little things that something will just have to spark your interest at some point in, in your life uh, as a student. So that was my like, wow moment uh, at the age of nine. And um, I really, really wanted to learn more about our past. And even till now, I keep asking myself and wondering, why isn't everyone an archaeologist? Why doesn't everyone want to do this? Because that's how, you know, you have to be super passionate about what you do and super excited all the time, of course. Um, but one of the main things I always try to uh, convey to other students that I come across is, you know, you don't have to be from the Amazon or somewhere exotic um, to be able to to explore. It's it's something you could do anywhere in the world. Of course, my own backyard is Egypt. I'm lucky enough that it's, I personally, I think one of the coolest places, of course, but also you can explore anywhere, any in anyone's own backyard. There's history and culture anywhere in the world. So this is something I always try to get uh, get across because a lot of um, classrooms that I deal with all over the world who aren't from, you know, countries that have thousands and thousands of years of, of uh, history. No, you could still explore in your own uh, your own city, even in the modern city that you're living in. Um, so this is something that's really important to me to you don't have to travel across the world and spend all this money to be able to do something like this. But also, um, Something to, that ignited the spark with people with me when I'm when I'm actually digging. We do a lot of community archaeology, so that's basically um, we work hand in hand with the people that are from the actual cities, the little towns that I dig in. So these are also um, Egyptians, 
but from different classes, you know, different cultures completely. Egypt as a whole is very multifaceted and very complex in its cultures. So I learn from them and they learn from me. So here's a picture, for example, of me and some of my team. There are people from, um, some are from south of Egypt, from Luxor and Aswan, and some are from up in, up north in the Delta. And, and these people really, um, don't get educated about our history whatsoever. So they always ask me all the time, why are you digging through the dirt all the time? What are you guys looking at? It just looks like garbage to us, you know? So we have to explain to them uh, step by step and they get, become really interested. So some of one of the things I actually learned from one of my uh, team members was this urban legend that uh, popped up at one of my sites up north. There was a sarcophagus that was just lying on the site. So it's a big stone. Um, a box where a mummy would have been placed in. So it was too big and heavy for any of the looters in antiquity to be able to loot it. So they just left it on site. So you see that a lot of the times in sites in Egypt, just things left thrown on the surface. And I remember coming to site every day and I kept seeing that, noticing that the sarcophagus was uh, wet every day. And it was the only thing on the site that was wet. It doesn't rain really much up there. So it was very strange. So it was happening for every day for a good, week i would say so i remember i asked one of my member team members i said is there something i'm missing why is it always wet on this particular object and he said oh this is actually urine so it's actually one of the uh, urban legends in this area was that the women every time during this specific month in the year the women in the village would urinate on the sarcophagus because it was a fertility ritual that they had said claim went passed down from generation to generation and that this would actually help you get pregnant and that this was something that came back from pharaonic times so i have not tried and tested it i wasn't ready to do that but it was something so interesting that i wasn't going to learn from um you know necessarily in the classroom but something we learned from people on site and um from community archaeology so not i don't uh, they don't only learn from us but we also learn from them and um, most of these uh, people are very rural, you know, farming, very simple, simple lives, lead, leading simple lives, but society has deemed them uneducated, especially in a society in Egypt. Um, so they, they think that, you know, this is the max uh, of, you know, their ambitions and their careers and they can't achieve certain things, but we can all change the world. And this is something we try to show them. Like I work hand by hand by with them and show them um, more about their history. And so, they could actually be proud of where they come from. A lot of them come from, I mean, the sites we're working at, these are ancient royal cities and they have no idea that, you know, these are actually your ancestors. It's actually something pretty cool to say, this is my my hometown. But in modern day Egypt, it just looks like a rural village, but it's not the case. Um, one thing, one of my, um, um, one of the, my team members, had asked me that stuck with me was if you didn't come to work on our site, how had we arafna? He said this in Arabic, and it meant, would anyone even know about us? Would anyone know about this village in general? And most people don't know about these sites because, you know, they seem like they're they're trash dumps and they have nothing uh, of use or value, and they're not the capital city like Cairo or anything. But actually, these sites are so incredibly rich and. Because of that, we actually worked on with National Geographic on a children's book that we wrote it in English and Arabic, and it was uh, very simply made. Um, we got our site artist to do a cartoon to show what archaeologists do on the site, what happened to the site, where, how did it get from becoming a royal site thousands of years ago till today, and we passed it around. I personally took it to all the schools in this village, and this it was aimed at children, but actually it was more of a hit with the adults. Uh, in the in the village because it was so uh, simplified. You don't have all the scientific jargon and all that. And everyone was so proud of where they came from. So this is something, an initiative I'm trying to do in all of the sites we work at um, for people to, to kind of have value for where they uh, originate from. Um, and another thing that um, is something that's so important that I have learned through my National Geographic journey was definitely uh, find your tribe. So what I mean by this is you should always encourage students to find like-minded uh, individuals with them. And no, I don't mean um, having you know the exact same hobbies or anything like this, but for example, this is my tribe and this image. Uh, these are um, my colleagues from the first uh, Nat Geo cohort of the 2017 leadership. 
program. So we were the first guinea pigs um, of explorers that they were um, testing out to see, you know, how we would um, be molded into young leaders in our, our respective fields. And I was the only archaeologist in this group. I mean, the rest are incredible, incredible human beings of, you know, biologists, uh, photojournalists, you name it, all over the place. Um, and, you know, they're in, they're huge change makers uh, in, in the industry right now. And the point is, you should always find your tribe. They're, these are, we're not the same career, none of us. Uh, we don't overlap in that sense. But what we do overlap in is our drive. We we have a, the same drive um, in wanting to make an impact, uh, no matter how small it is. We want to make some sort of impact uh, on and make our mark on this world uh, in whatever field we're doing and whatever way we can. So we definitely know we're not, I mean, I won't change the world on my own, but it's when you have many, many like-minded people in your circle around you that you can bounce off ideas off or in your network, this helps you boost your your career or your goals to another level, 100%. So this is one of the main things I took out of my entire experience on this platform of being into uh, the National Geographic world. It was definitely that. So I encourage educators and students alike to surround yourself with people that are, call them your tribe. You know, these are people that will push you, motivate you, um, help you get to where you want to go and focus on that goal that you want in the end. So I wanted to um, dive into a little bit of how we can use our past to live a better future. So this is another, um, the next couple of images are sites, uh, uh, images of one of the sites I work at. Um, so you could see in the, in the background, these are buildings where people are living today. And then here you can see there's a mosque uh, up north, the previous image, there was a football field. These things are modern additions to these ancient sites. Uh, the greenery, these are all uh, also modern agricultural fields um, for farming. So here you can see I have, I have it labeled, the archaeological site is up front here and in the background, the agricultural land. So there's literally, they are side by side. So this is why um, I work uh, in these sites because they are being encroached so quickly. So actually in the next 20 to 30 years, these sites will not exist anymore. So that's in my own lifetime. Um, you could see here in the middle, there's a trash dump from the modern villages. They use it. They themselves use it as a trash dump because there's nowhere else to dump their trash. Um, and from the surface, these sites look like they have no value. But again, right beneath the surface, we find tons of things and we're able to, to identify these sites and locate them and learn more. So a part of my work is to educate um, and use archaeology as a tool by educating the people in these areas about the value of these sites and so they can value it and then they'll in return protect these sites instead of um, either looting or you tra dumping trash or whatever to be able to slow down I guess the encroachment because we can't prevent it completely but we can slow it down um, to help us so how do we prevent looting as I said it's education everything leads back to education um, from the classroom to our students in the city to the people on site living um, right around these archaeological sites because when somebody gives you uh, knowledge she gives you power and i stand by this a thousand percent um i think the the most admirable um profession is to be an educator um to teachers as a whole i mean you have all the power in the palm of your hands to be able to inspire and uh, lead you know generations and generations of future um, change makers in the world and whatever field it is and that's it's really true this is where the core comes from uh, it does start in the classroom um, and what they do with it later this is these are the tools that we need to give them in the real world once they're out of the classroom because they're gonna have to execute it themselves so for me we teach local communities the skills that they need to be able to empower them to take control of their own destiny. So a lot of my workers, I mean, they just dig with me during the seasons, but they they turn out to be, have their own profession. Some are uh, great dentists, lawyers, you know, they turn out to be something and these are from the rural villages. So you need to be able to empower them and know that th these things are attainable for them as well. Uh, a lot of people think that they hear these career choices and think, uh, especially as an archeologist, I get asked all the time, oh, is it even a real job? You know, they think these things are just in movies and not attainable, but no, everything's attainable. If you actually want to do something, you're, you'll be able to. So every threat gives you more commitment to the cause. So the main thing I want to leave you guys off with is basically 
protect the things you care about. This is one of the main things um, I I try to in, uh, enforce in all of the work that I do. Um, these sites, these archaeological sites are things I care about, so I'll do anything that I can to protect it. So basically for any of the students that um, you have in your classrooms, I would say if they really want something, essentially, you know, any human will do whatever it takes to get it, right? So we don't need to focus necessarily on the means to an end as much as we need to focus on them finding that passion. So what they that's the, the actual hard part it is to find. I have friends till now who still don't don't know what their actual passion is or what they really what drives them. So that's the hard part. And the passion will always, mind you, will always continue to evolve and change and grow. Mine still changes every day by the hour, I'm sure. But um, you need to find that initial core trigger. There's a core trigger, a core memory with every person of something that lights up that fire in you that ignites some sort of drive of what you wanna do in this world. So we need to focus on exposing students, I think, to as many things possible as they can, because you never know what will actually spark a child's interest. You never know exactly what it is. So it's also trial and error and whatever just happens will spark it. I mean, in my own class, when I was nine years old, I was the only one that was sparked by, you know, the archeology span video in school. No one else was, everyone else was probably sleeping. So, I mean, you never know what it is that will catch someone's interest, but that little tiny thing will plant the seed and that person can, you know, change the world and do something great with it. So the main message I would say I would, to leave you off with would be figure out how you want to make an impact and leave your mark in this world and use that as, a, as the main focus. It's always, I always say to myself, what kind of impact do I want to make right now? No matter how small it is, nothing has to be huge and, you know, cliche. It's just the tiniest things can make an impact in this world. And collectively, you know, we're all making it transform and making it better in the future. So the best thing we can all do is leave the world a better place than we found it. So this is something we're, we're all supposed to do as a, as a collective effort and something, you know, I encourage everyone to focus on. So I wanted to leave you um, with that, but uh, let's go back to uh, using, you know, uh, more of the practical side and how we can um, use that and use these tools um, in the classroom and what we can actually do. I'll give it up to Princess. Thank you, Nora. Um, so I wanna ask our educators that we have with us today, again, that phrase, we want our students to be change agents. Tell me, we're gonna do a waterfall chat. If you've been with us for the past few weeks, you should be familiar. If not, what that means is you're going to type the answer to the question, what are you currently doing to promote this? What are you currently doing to promote your students becoming change agents? How are you helping to develop that in your students? You're going to type your response in the chat without hitting enter. When I say the word for this week will be change, everyone will hit enter at the same time and the responses will cascade in the chat like a waterfall. So right now, consider that phrase, we want our students to be change agents. What are you currently doing in your classrooms to promote this? Write your answers in the chat without hitting enter. you a few more seconds. Again, remember we are typing our responses in the chat without hitting enter. Okay, change. Here we go, seeing the responses flooding in now. Feel free to scroll up and read some of your colleagues' responses, giving them agency. Absolutely, voice and choice is an incredible tool. Supporting their choices, creating opportunities for students to choose activities. 
that they feel ownership and responsibility for their learning. Oh, being an example. I love these responses, inquiry-based learning, lessons related to the real world. Absolutely, helping students make connections, explicit teaching on how they can do things like reduce pollution. Very nice, very nice responses. Um, so what I'm gonna do now, I'm just gonna give you some quick kind of tips and things that you can do in your classrooms to cultivate an environment to where your students can be change agents. And the very first thing is nothing new. Again, it was the very first session that we had, critical thinking. Encourage students to question, analyze, and think critically about the world around them. This really helps them to identify issues that require change. And then teach them problem solving skills and strategies that enable them to tackle real world issues effectively, okay? So just some examples of some things that you can do in class, having them really examine infographics about topics that are important. Um, having them problem solve, okay? Think about if things are a good solution. Okay, you see the example here from science. Would vertical forest towers work in their community? They can really kind of think through that and see if it's a decent solution. Okay, having them do things like make predictions and inferences and compare and contrast, make arguments, all of those things really help students build and develop those critical thinking skills that they can use to solve problems that impact the real world. Another thing, open dialogue. Create a classroom culture where students feel safe to express their opinions and ideas, encourage open discussions and debates, okay? I think the key here is that it needs to be a safe space to where they can express themselves freely, okay? So having those discussions um, can start with images, videos, and things like that. Here's a nice quote. If we cannot sustain the environment, we cannot sustain ourselves. Asking students, do they agree? Why or why not? And having a discussion around that. Okay, having students analyze photographs. Why is this orangutan in the river? They don't really like rivers, but is it because the forest has been encroached upon and their habitat is dwindling? Okay, a nice rich discussion around that. It's gonna be beneficial for our students. We talked about this a little bit in the last session, project-based learning, incorporating projects that address real world problems, um, giving students a sense of agency by involving them in the decision-making process related to those activities and projects that you're going to do. Incorporating projects and assignments that require students to foster uh, their ability to initiate change. So these projects are going to relate to real world problems. And then emphasize teamwork and collaboration, okay? Change often requires collective efforts. Okay, we typically can't do it alone. So assign group projects that, take, that tackle community and societal issues. There's some examples of some nice projects that can be done. Okay, here's an example of creating a sustainable living plan. What I really like about this is that you give students an immediate opportunity to take action right after this. Um, so they look at the things that they said in this plan and we ask them to actually act on it. Choose one of those actions that you put in the plan. You said it was a great way to live sustainably, incorporate into your daily life, okay? So they can immediately start taking those steps um, to be a change agent. Here's another example. Again, giving them options and uh, the ability to take action at the personal, school, local, global, uh, global level, excuse me, give them, them the opportunities, they can affect change immediately. There's another example of a project where they're looking at uh, solar and wind power. Again, things that directly relate to the real world, it's gonna be very impactful. Another thing that's also helpful for students, role models, share stories and examples of change agents who made a difference 
inspiring students to follow suit, okay? Draw from current and historical figures, okay? People that they're familiar with, um, people that are also teenagers. It's also a great way so that they can see people my age can make a difference. When the best leaders work, it's done. The people say we did it so that they can see how impactful it is to be a part of this initiative. Here's some other examples of some change agents. Again, they can see. And then draw on some of those historical figures as well. Think about the text and the literature that you have your students read. Give them some models, some examples to, to aspire to be like. Experiential learning. Organize things like field trips, guest speakers, experiential learning opportunities that expose students to diverse perspectives and real world challenges. Global, when think about global awareness, right? We wanna encourage our students to explore global issues and consider their role as global citizens and connect those local issues to broader contexts. That's really gonna help students explore global issues. There's some examples of some things that can be done uh, to restore habitat. Students can um, find an expert from a local nature reserve, right? Organize a field trip and then talk about some things that they can do to help and document and share that, pro that process. They could plant a tree. We saw a video about that at the very beginning, okay? So they can get some people involved to begin planting trees. Again, document what they're doing and share their work. And then I think I, I've said this in the past, celebrate the success. So recognize and celebrate students' initiatives and their achievements in affecting positive change. That really reinforces their motivation. Um, change agents often contribute to committed community building. So get the community involved, showcase what they're doing um, to the, the community. So there's a sense of unity and cohesiveness. We started and we went back to the statement. We want our students to be change agents, okay? This is something that doesn't come naturally to most. As educators, we have to cultivate a classroom that allows students to do this, that allows them to be a change agent that sparks something inside of them, right? Uh, a few weeks ago, we did a session on sustainable development goals and how to integrate them into our curriculum. And one of the things we looked at was we have a lot of work to do if we want to reach these goals. Okay, we can't do it alone. And it's going to take more than just our generation to do it. We need the next generation to get on board and be involved as well. So it's it's crucial for us as educators to ensure that our students actually do become change agents. We can't just say it. We want our students to be change agents, right? We have to do something to ensure that that happens. And some of these tips that we went over will do just that. Another thing that you can do to kind of help your students make a difference and get involved is something that we um, are doing here called the Slingshot Challenge. Um, and Davida will tell us a little bit more about that. Thank you, Princess, and thank you, Nora. I truly enjoyed listening to both of you. And Nora, I loved your stories about, um, it was an excellent educator um, in grade three that really ignited you to want to become an archeologist. And I think that's what kind of what this is about is expiring change and as educators, um, this is part of our responsibility. Our, our youth and our young learners, they're gonna be the ones that are gonna be taking care of us and taking care of society and they're gonna become those future change agents. So thank you both for some of those ideas. And I'll, when I'm an educator and so whenever I lead a webinar or some type of PD session is something that I can take away that's tangible. What can I do now? And so we wanted to provide you with something that you can do now and that you can ignite or spark your students to participate in. And it is called the Slingshot Challenge. And this is a challenge actually that has been started by the National Geographic Society. So the society started this challenge about three years ago and it's aimed to be an innovative youth challenge 
for students ages 13 to 18. So this is gonna be for our secondary students. And it's aimed to identify and support the next generation of problem solvers, these advocates and stewards for the planet. When I think about change agents, I think about people that are really want to make our planet more safer, fairer, and more sustainable to live in. And that's what this challenge is designed to do. And there's going to be five key areas for conservation that the challenge is gonna aim students to look at. They're clean the air, restore the ocean, protect nature, reduce waste, and address climate change. And it's challenging students to not only look at these issues globally, but perhaps to look at how they can make change within their local communities as well. One of our explorers talks about think globally, but also think locally and then act globally. So how can you look at some of these initiatives from your own local landscape? So what the challenge is in essence is that students will be charged to do research on those five areas. And then they're going to create and share to the society a one minute video focused on solving an important environmental issue in their community or in their global wider global community related to one of those five topics. So one minute video, and it's really up to you guys. You can decide that you want to do this as a class challenge. So your class will create a one minute video. You may have students to break up into groups and to research some of those five areas and decide on something that really sparks them. You know, uh, Nora talked about that, something that ignites their passion, something that they're interested in, or it could be an individual student project. Um, the society has already opened the challenge up. They opened it up last week. So the challenge is starting and we will send our school's information that will provide a student toolkit, some information on how to register links. They can also watch some of our explorers in action as they're talking about some of these five key topics. Additionally, within the resources that we'll provide will be a teacher toolkit, some, some takeaways and some things that you can provide to students to help to get them really sparked and engaged to participate in the challenge. Additionally, we will be hosting some additional webinars with some of our key explorers like Nora across over the next few months to really, again, help students to, and these will be student-facing events, to help them to understand some of these environmental issues and how they can make the change. And then what's great about this, all students love this, it is a challenge, it's a contest. And so one of the key events is that students that enter, the one that the students that win or the class, they will be awarded up to 10,000 US dollars to fund their research. This is great. This is what explorers do. They, they present to the society uh, something that they're really interested in and how they want to do it. And then the top winner receives funding to help to further their journey and how they can become a change agent and make impact. So we really hope that you participate. We'll be sending you more information on the screen now. It's a QR code. So I urge you to um, look at the QR code and to find some of the more information about the challenge. And then Princess and I, over the course of the next few weeks, will be sharing more information on our social media um, blasts or LinkedIn about the Slingshot Challenge and then sending it to your schools and hoping that you will engage. If you are deciding to engage, but you want more information, please feel free to reach out to one of us and we can give you more information. Um, most of you are joining from our GCC cohort. And so we are geared to really have someone from this region to win this year. And you will also in the toolkit, see some of the um, students that have won previous years and to see some innovative um, things that they came up for their video and how they want to make change. So if it's something you're interested in or if you have more questions about the Slingshot Challenge, please feel free to reach out to us. And we're also gonna just open up for the next uh, 10 minutes to questions that you may have for Nora or for Princess or myself regarding any of the things, information that was shared with you today or over the course of the last few weeks and how we can help to bring this to reality in your classrooms. Thank you guys. So I'll turn it back to Norm Princess and see if any of our participants have questions.
And I did see one early on, um, just reminding us to please any of the examples of some of those project-based learning activities that we have to share them in the Padlet. So we will make sure that we share that for you. So I saw that earlier. Okay, uh, we'll do. And then another question that always comes up, um, certificates will be emailed to all participants um, in about three to five days. Um, so everybody who is with us today will get a certificate. Wonderful. And Nora, I have a question maybe to get the Q&A started. Um, just with some of these initiatives that Princess spoke about and then the slingshot, what are some ideas that you would give to teachers on how to really kind of get some of these practical ways to start um, igniting students to become change agents? What is maybe one or two suggestions that you could give to um, teachers? I think if they can get them out of the classroom, um, a lot of things are, mm -hmm. uh, a lot of these field trips are super useful. I know not all schools are able to do that, but definitely I would encourage it. I mean, these are the things that that really ignite something in students, from my experience at least, uh, getting out of the classroom and then coming back and then, you know, figure out how to execute certain things. I think linking the two is really important that not everything should be just classroom based and not everything should be, you know, in the field as well. I think it should go hand in hand uh, to make it more like multifaceted to be able to use all the tools. Well, that's that's a great idea. Yeah, getting out of the classroom or, you know, kind of bringing the outside world into your classroom, even if it's through a virtual field trip. So I love that idea. Anything that's just a bit more interactive. I think yeah. even nowadays, just everyone's attention span is so short, especially with like <laughs> social media and all of that. So it's it's just to get them more more involved and more hands-on. I love that. Anyone else have any questions or comments? And thank you, thank you. And I see some people already saying they're geared up I'm ready to uh, bring the Slingshot Challenge to their students. So I'm really excited to see some of those comments as well in the um, chat. Honestly, it looks like a cool challenge. I wish I was eligible for it. <laughs> I, <would have> applied. <laughs> I was at a school earlier today, uh, Nora and Avi Davi, and um, one of the coordinators said the exact same thing. The age group, I wish I was eligible. I know. I love to kind of bring some of my ideas and so we talked and about the how prize we, is great ten thousand yeah, dollars can really yes. help research that is big. amazing so yeah whoever gets it that student's going to be very very lucky exactly um and then i've also put in the chat um for those of you the padlet that uh, Ms. Princess has created that has a wealth of resources for this session. And then Princess, I believe you've also recreated a master padlet as well? Yes. Um, so the master padlet is just a link to all of the previous padlets throughout the series. So everything basically in one place. Great. Um, and then, I, yeah, go ahead, Princess. <laughs> I see a question asking if there's going to be a similar challenge for younger children, the slingshot. As of right now, there isn't. Uh, Davida, do you know um, if that is going to change or do you know anything else about that? So not for the slingshot challenge, but I think this is coming from Angelique. So great question. Um, not for the slingshot. However, we are going to have information regarding how students can participate in COP28 which is also a very important event that's coming to the UAE. The UAE is hosting, um, that's all about sustainability, and conservation, um, UNESCO, all of those agencies are participating. And so we are gonna be doing some challenges that will span across all grade levels for that. We will be putting information out um, by, I think early next week regarding how schools across primary, even into KG up until secondary can participate in COP28 challenges that we will have um, for the region. So more information to be coming very soon about that. So great question. Thank you. Uh, any other questions? I'm just kind of scrolling through the chat, not seeing any questions. Um, so 
again, just thank you all so much, um, especially those who have joined me every week uh, over mm -hmm. the past four weeks or for those who you know weren't able to join all of them, but joined a few, even those who were here for the first time today. We truly, truly appreciate it. This uh, series has been uh, amazing um, and it couldn't have been without all of you logging in um, each and every week. So thank you, thank you so much. Um, please make sure that you um, register so that you hear more about what we have coming. We will definitely have some more events coming up in the future. I will leave you with um, myself and Nora's contact information. Feel free to reach out if you have additional questions, if you wanna talk about anything in further detail. Thank you all so much and enjoy the rest of your evening. Thank you everyone for joining and a huge thank you to Nora, our special guest for joining us. Really excited to have you. Hope you can come back and join us for future events and a huge thank you to Princess for hosting the Back to School series over the course of the last few weeks. So thank you both and everyone have a wonderful evening. Enjoy the rest of your week. Thank you. Thank Bye. you. Bye.